video. Um, Eddie. Oceana? Oceana. 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 Big kids, do you guys know five of those ten names? Caleb, Egal, Hosea, which is Joshua, Paul T, Gadiel, um, Gaddy, Amiel, Zether, Nabi, Guel, Guel. Okay. Very good. Brighton, Brighton. Real loud. Shafa, Shalev, Igal. What? Oshia, Pafala. Pafala. Oh, you know what? I like Ariel's version. What Bible do you have, Ariel? I think you pronounced it very well. Yeah. Oh, Brighton. Oh, Brighton. Brighton. Sorry. Brighton. I like your. I like. I like you pronounced it very good. Go ahead, Campbell. <laughs> okay, what do you think, Pastor John Bradshaw? Was any of them close? I think they were all pretty good. Okay. Yeah, I think okay. Yeah, good. Okay. You know what, kids and big kids? I want to test you guys again tonight. So you guys are going to have to listen very, very carefully. I want to be very, very specific and detailed, okay, in my questions, okay? So listen very carefully to what Pastor John Bradshaw has to say this morning. Once again, we want to thank Pastor John Bradshaw for taking time out of his busy schedule. Being here, let's give him a thank you. Say thank you. Thank you, thank you, Pastor John Bradshaw. May God bless you. Amen. Oh, cool. This is fantastic. For the rest of the day, I get to smell like smoke. I don't know if you know there's some laws in the world. If you drop something, it lands on the ground. That's called the law of gravity. And if you stand near a campfire, no matter where you stand, the smoke follows you. I don't know what that law is called, but that's a law. And you sit on the front row, it's smoke. And then what you should do is you'd move and sit over here and the smoke will follow you. <laughs> Just does that. Well, I'm glad to see you this morning. Thank you. We have kids of all ages here. That's encouraging. Let's say a prayer and expect God to bless us. We don't have long because I know that someone here is hungry. Father in heaven, bless us as we open up the Bible, as we talk about the things of heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When I was in high school, I was on the basketball team. For about uh, about two weeks, three weeks, then I said, "Oh, this isn't this isn't rugby. I don't have to play basketball any longer." Uh, and I don't know a whole lot about basketball except I am wearing my Oklahoma City Thunder shirt. But that's just a coincidence. You know why, right? Because hold on. he lost. Because they didn't lose because look who plays for them. Stephen Adams, who is from what country, Pastor Douglas? I'm the best country in the world. From New Zealand. So, I'm not an Oklahoma City fan, I'm a New Zealand fan, and he plays and he's a New Zealander. Anyway, I don't know a whole lot about basketball, but I heard this very interesting story. There was a team in California, a girls team, they're about 12 years old, and they needed a coach. Ordinarily, if you get a coach, a coach is someone who has, what has a coach normally done? If a coach is coaching basketball or football or... Has played basketball. Has played basketball. As ordinarily, has at least played basketball. Well, they couldn't find a coach. And so a man said, I'll coach them. His daughter played in the team. He was originally from that basketball powerhouse nation, India. He was an Indian man. And this was in right around the San Francisco area in the place they call Silicon Valley because there they do a lot of computer manufacturing. He said, I'll coach the team. And they said, do you know anything about the game? He said, no, but it can't be too hard, can it? And they said, oh, well, we can't find anybody else. So you get the job. 
and it was just like a 12-year-old girls team. What I mean, I don't mean to be dismissive, what I mean is it wasn't a college team, it wasn't a professional team, it was just about having fun. So that was all okay. He said, well, what do I do now? I don't know anything about it. So he read some books. Read some books about basketball, read some books about coaching. He said, now I've read some books, I still don't know anything about it, but I'll try. Well, well, he did something very interesting when he coached. If you ever see a basketball game, here's what happens. It's the same thing over and over again. You get the ball at one end, and you bounce the ball, you dribble the ball, and the whole objective, the whole idea is to get to the other end and do what? Get the ball in the basket. Now, if you've ever watched a game, if my team has the ball and I'm coming up the court, what does the other team ordinarily do? Yeah, but, but you know what happens. Four of them, because there's five on the court at the same time, run back. They didn't even go near me with the ball, but one of them comes up and, you know, tries to get in my way and stop me. You understand? Because the other four are all marking the other players. Because they don't want me to throw the ball to the guy under the basket and there's no one there and he just dunks it or throws it in. But this guy said, that doesn't seem like a good idea. If someone has the ball, why don't we just swarm the guy? Well, in this case, the girl. Let's just get all over her and she won't hardly even, she won't even be able to pass the ball. No one does that. They call that, I think they call that a full ball press. I think they do. And so here's what would happen. The other team, the girl would have the ball and she'd start bouncing it. And five girls from this team, boom, they'd surround her. They'd swarm her like a swarm of angry bees. And she'd be like, oh man, I, what do I do? I can't pass the ball. And they would get the ball off her and shoot the ball and they'd score. And they started to win games. In fact, they won every game. No other team was doing this. No team at college does this, no professional team does this, no team does this, except a, girl, a, a, a team of 12-year-old girls coached by a man from India who knows nothing about basketball tried this, what they call an unorthodox approach. It's like thinking outside the box. He just did it a little differently. It was very, very effective. It was so effective they won every game and they made it all the way to the state championships. And they made it to the finals of the California State Championship. And they Won. lost. <laughs> but they lost in the final, which was outstanding. And none of these girls were, were good basketball players. They were just, just regular kids who were playing basketball. But they did so well because the man, the coach, came at this thing with a different approach, a simple approach, not the same approach as everybody else. He said, we'll do things differently. Well, I want to look at a little Bible story with you. We just have a few minutes about someone who did things differently. If you have your Bible, open it up to 1 Samuel chapter 17. The Bible says, you turn there while I start reading, it's okay, you'll catch up. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and they were gathered together at Shoko, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Ezekiah and Ephes Demon. All right. And so, you had in verse 2, Saul and the men of Israel. Saul was the what of Israel? He was the king on one side and the Philistines on the other side. It was like these mountains with, and notice what the Bible says, and there was a valley between them. Now this is a very simple point, but I don't want you to miss it. On one side with the people of God, another side with the people who are against God, and there was a gap between them. You know what I think this suggests to us? that there ought to be some difference between the people of God and the people who are not of God. Mm. There's a temptation sometimes to be as much like non-Christians as we possibly can. We do what they do, we talk about what they talk about, we, we, we eat where they eat, we go where they go, we wear what they wear, we act like them, even though they're not followers of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should be a little bit different, don't you think? Yeah. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, then Jesus it kind of rubs off on you. Because when Jesus gets in your life, he makes you different. So here was God's people, and really I'm just going to call them the devil's people because that's what they were, and there was a valley between them. And there was a champion out of the camp of the Philistines. His name was what? Goliath. Goliath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Do you know how much a cubit is? It's about 18 inches, about a foot and a half. All right, mathematicians. We have some mathematicians here. Six times one and a half feet is how many feet? Nine. Nine feet. You know how tall that is? If I was standing here, you wouldn't be able to see my head. 
you would just be able to see about up to here. And then the rest of me would disappear above the top of the tent. Nine feet, to, well, nine feet and a span. So it's about nine feet four, nine feet five. Taller than anyone you've ever seen. Very big guy. If he was playing basketball, well, he would have to duck. Well, no, how high is the hoop? Ten foot. Ten. He would just be able to take the ball and put it in. He wouldn't even have to dunk. Very, very tall man. He had a helmet made out of brass. He had this amazing coat of armor. Uh, he had he had these things made out of brass on his legs. He had a, a spear so big they say the, the spear was like a weaver's beam. That's when they used to do weaving at a loom. They have a big long stick that they shuttled through with the with the wool or whatever on it. He was very big, and someone went before him carrying a shield to protect him. He had all that armor on, and yet somebody went in front of him carrying a shield. I do not think I would want that man's job. And then he cried out, send somebody out here to fight me. Send somebody out. If you are able to fight me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. He said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now here's what's interesting. The king of Israel was Saul. And when he heard these words, it says, he was, he was dismayed. He and all Israel. And they were greatly afraid. But the Bible now introduces us to a new individual. First we have the king. And can you tell me something that was interesting about King Saul that made him different from everybody else? He was tall too. That is, he was a head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. So he had to be about six feet, seven inches tall, I guess. Something like that. He was tall. Man, it's like the law of gravity. Well, the Bible says there was a young man named David. David was the youngest of the sons of Jesse. And uh, he would feed the sheep, his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Interesting Bethlehem. You know what happened in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. And the Philistines came near the people of Israel every morning and every evening. And it says Goliath presented himself for 40 days. For almost six weeks he was defying the armies. Send somebody down here to fight me. Well, David's father, whose name was what? Jesse. Jesse, he said, go and take some food down there to the boys at the battle. Take some food down there. So he did. And when he got down there, he said, what's this? What's going on? And they said, oh, there's a champion. Verse 23, the Philistine of Gath, his name was Goliath. And, and David heard what was going on. And all the men of Israel, when they saw Goliath, they fled. They fled. And they were sore afraid. What well, David said in verse 26, what's going on here? And people explain. David's brothers were angry with him. What are you doing coming down here? Who have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Those were catty words, weren't they? I know your pride and the naughtiness of your heart. You are come down that you might see the battle. David said, what have I done wrong now? Until he asked others, and they spoke to him the same way. And David watched what was going on. David said this, he said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. He was a boy. How old do you think he was? 13, so we got someone said 13, someone said 17. 12, I reckon he was around about 13 to 17. I'm thinking, I don't know this, I don't have any divine insight. I'm thinking he was like 15 or 16. I just think 16, I don't know why, but I do. So that's between 13 and 17. I think we're right. David said, I'll go, I'll fight. <laughs> the king said, you aren't able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're but a youth. And he is but a man of war from his youth. Now, part of the story teaches us that young people can do anything. However, if you see a man who's nine and a half feet tall, don't go out to fight him thinking young people can do anything. I mean, unless God tells you to do that, but I think that's unlikely. Don't get the wrong message this morning. You are not able to go. And then David said, your servant kept his father's sheep. There came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. Get this. And I went out after him and I smote him and just delivered him out of his mouth. 
And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. I slew both the lion and the bear. And this Philistine will be just like one of them. Because he has defied the armies of the living God. Mm. You know, very interesting. I was talking when I was in Zimbabwe to a pastor. He said that he would walk from church to church. He would have to walk through the bush. And he was walking one day and he stumbled into a clearing and there was a lion. A lion. And the lion had some cubs. It was not a good thing to stumble upon a lion with cubs. And even though he lived in Africa and was accustomed to being around lions, he did not think, I will go and catch this lion by the beard and slay him. He was worried. But he heard a voice that said, go on, you can... No, 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 a man came out and said, it's okay, you can go forward, you'll be okay. He didn't know who the man was, but he said, all right. And so he started walking. And the lioness got up and walked away. The cubs followed. And he turned around and the man... Was gone. Was gone. He'd never seen the man before. He never saw him again. Didn't know where he came from. He was convinced that that man was no, an angel. He was convinced. Lions are scary things. David killed a lion and a bear. But my son Jacob, who's sitting right there, was just a small guy, about three years old. We went to a, a little zoo near where we lived, and it was essentially a, a lion zoo. There's all kinds of lions and tigers, mainly because people who have pet lions and pet tigers, when they get big, they don't know what to do with them, so they give them to this guy who puts them in their zoo. And we were walking past one enclosure, my little boy and I, he was just a little, little guy, and there was a lion, and he put his nose down like this, and his rump went up in the air, and he followed us along. <laughs> if that fence hadn't been there, we would have been on the menu that that lion would have been looking over for breakfast. Would not have been good. David killed the lion, and he killed the bear, and he never forgot, he never forgot. He said, he said, if I could kill a lion and a bear, then I reckon I can kill this Philistine. Interesting, isn't it? Did, did David really have the power and the strength to kill a lion and a bear? No. No, that came from who? God. So David was saying, and listen, this is a very important lesson to learn. David was saying, if God could help me do that, God can help me do anything. You know what you should never forget? You should never forget what God does for you. Amen. You should never forget. Because then when you get to another situation, you can say, God was with me once before. God will be with me again. Amen. It's very important to remember what God does. Remember the prayers that He answers. <clears throat> remember the, the miracles that you see. Remem remember even what God does for other people. Amen. If you say, oh, I have a boring kind of a life and I don't see any miracles. Well, you can say, oh, my friend saw a miracle. That's good enough for me. And then you can say, if God could do that, God can do this. By the way, you can look into the Bible and say, if God can do that, then God can help me. So David said, the Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the bear, he will deliver me. God delivered me from them. God will deliver me from this giant. He was a giant. And so you remember the story? Saul put his armor on David. It was too big because David, Saul was big and tall. David was just a, a youth. And David said, no, no, it's not going to work. He took him off. So what did he do? He took a stick in his hand. And then he went down to the brook. A brook is just a what? It's a stream. And what did he get out of the stream? Five. Five stones. Five stones. And he put them in his little bag. And he had a sling. And a sling was typically made out of what? Leather. So, he was a giant that the best soldiers in Israel could do nothing about. For 40 days. You know, that number 40 pops up in the Bible a lot. Can you think of some other 40s in the Bible? Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark. Jesus what? In the, wilderness. in the wilderness, correct. Do you think of anything else? Twelve spies. The twelve spies, they searched the, up for 40 days. Forty years in the desert. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. You know, when you see that 40, often what it means is a, a, a period of some trial or some waiting, followed by deliverance. Forty days of rain, then the rain stopped. Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness, and then he wasn't. It was a period of trial or testing, followed by deliverance, often. That's what it means. So this Goliath, he should have known when he got up to day 40, it was all over for him because God was going to do something great. And so the Philistine, the Philistine came down. Oh, oh, I missed out an important point. And he drew near to the Philistine. If it was me, 
Now this is a terrible thing to mention. I just I just read that a soldier in Canada just set a record for shooting someone from the furthest distance. He had this high-powered gun and it was in the Middle East and he was a sniper and he shot someone from over two miles away. Wow. Yeah. Which, uh, I mean, I know how you, I couldn't shoot the sky from two miles away. <laughs> if it was me, I would have got a gun and I would have got two miles away. That would have been the thing. But David got a stones and his little strip of leather and he, and he got close to the Philistine. Wow. This guy had no fear. None at all. Fixed it. No fear. <laughs> and then the giant looks down and he sees a kid. He says, what is this? He said, am I a dog that you come up to me with a stick? And the Philistine cursed David. And he said, you come here and I will give your flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. I will feed you to animals. Wow, there's some nasty stuff in the Bible. He was a nasty guy because he wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And then he threatened him. He said, You wait till I'm done with you. See, what this reminds me of is that basketball coach. He didn't know too much about the game. And his approach was radical. It was different. It was unorthodox. He was thinking out of the box. David was thinking out of the box. Who goes into a war situation with a giant? And by the way, it wasn't just the giant and nobody else. It was the giant and all the host of the armies of the Philistines. Who does that? He didn't go down there with a gun. He didn't go down. No one carrying a shield in front of him. He went down there with five stones and a stick and a strip of leather. This was unorthodox. It was different. It was irregular. It was unusual. It was thinking outside of the box. But he went down there with more than that. What else did he go down there with? God. He went down there with God. He went down there with God. I would like to suggest something to you today. In this world, the majority of people are not Christian. The vast majority. So that means that thinking like a Christian is really thinking outside the box. It's thinking a bit differently. You know what happened. Oh, I'll tell you this because this I, I think is, is fascinating. Uh, David said, This assembly will know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Now I want you to notice what happened. The Philistine, that's Goliath, got up and he came out to David. He was just going to have him for breakfast. And David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Ran towards him. I would have run away from him. <laughs> ran towards him. That's what he did. And he put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sunk deep into his forehead and he fell onto the ground. Would have been like a tree falling. Have you ever heard a tree fall over? Mm -hmm. I cut down a tree with a chainsaw just the other day. Very satisfying. The tree fell over. It's a big one. And the lie fell over and probably measured on the Richter scale. Someone in a lab somewhere said, there's been an earthquake. <laughs> you know, David approached his situation differently than anybody else. Differently than anybody else. No one else in all Israel would have gone out there with a strip of leather and five little stones. But David did. Because he was thinking God's way. He was relying on God. I don't know what situation you have coming up, whether it's at school or at work or at home or at church. I don't know what situation. But I want to encourage you to learn from this morning something you've already heard. To do it God's way and to lean on God and to trust in God. To trust in God to be able to get you through. You know, you know the weapon. Here's what Paul said. Though we walk in the flesh, 
we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What weapons has God given us in our warfare? Our warfare is a spiritual warfare. Our enemy is the devil. He's a mighty, mighty enemy. You would say he's a giant like the lion, except bigger and stronger. What weapons has God given to us? He's given us the Bible. He's given us the Word of God. What else has He given us? He's given us prayer. Those are weapons to use in our warfare. We can go to God and plead with God. We can take the Bible and read the Word of God. And then we have promises given us by God in His Word. And those are weapons to use in our warfare too. So our approach can be a pretty simple approach through getting through life or getting through life to lean on God and use the weapons that He has given us because they're truly mighty weapons. And when you use God's weapons, you don't experience defeat. There is power in the Word of God, so we've got to get the Word of God into us. There is power in prayer and talking to God. When you talk to God, you, 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 get on the, get, you become one with God in your mind and God's mind get all connected up together. Do you remember the story of David today? He went into battle like that basketball coach. He went into games thinking, we're just going to do things a little bit differently. He was successful. David did things a little bit differently. He was tremendously successful. You can afford to do things differently. Differently from everybody else. The greatest weapons that you will ever have, the Bible and prayer and your witness. They're weapons. And when you use those weapons, the giants will be conquered. They'll fall down before you. God will give you victory after victory. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you today for the story of David who defeated Goliath. What a victory, but what a lot of lessons for us to learn. So we thank you that there is no giant in our life or in this world that need defeat us. You've given us the weapons we need. They're a little different to the weapons people would use in a conventional warfare situation. But they're better, they're stronger. So we thank you for prayer. Make us people of prayer. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the Bible. There's power in it. Let that power get in us. We thank you also for our witness because there's power in that as well. So help us to be yours. Thank you for fighting our battles. We'll trust in you. We thank you for victory after victory. In Jesus' name, amen.